So hello and welcome to the Lewis Nichols Show and I'm really excited to bring on my next guest today. It's Mr. Daniel O'Donnell and this is your fifth decade in the music industry, isn't it now? Yeah, when you say it like that, it seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to impressive. talk to you, Lewis. Yes, I started out uh, in 1981 with my sister. And uh, so it'll be it's actually 40 years now coming and... Um, in January, so I suppose it runs into five decades from we start, 1890, 100, yeah, this is, this is the fifth decade. <laughs> I feel very old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, for you, where did your love of music come from? Was it something that you grew up around? Were your family musical? Yeah, we, we, we always loved music in the house. My sister, her name is Margot, had been singing when I was just a child. So we were very aware of music. And my, my all my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, on both sides of, of the family, my mother's family and my father's family, they all loved to sing. So we, we always had a great, um, I suppose, just joy and, and yeah. getting the opportunity to gather and, and have sing songs. And even now, if we do gather... You have to fight to get to the microphone because there's, <laughs> there's a huge amount of people waiting to sing. But uh, growing up, I suppose, because Margaret, I call her Margaret, Margot was her stage name. Um, she was very successful, you know, from the 60s right through. And um, because of that, I suppose, I was very aware of music. I, I can't remember not singing. Even as a child, I used to sing in the choir um, sing at local concerts, you know, that, that have them for the church and get the chance to sing there. So I've always, always, you know, enjoyed the opportunity to sing. And then I did go to college for a short period, but um, realised, I suppose, that I, I really did want to try the music and, you know, put all my eggs in one basket. I suppose I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, but I did it. And... Um, you know, just threw caution to the wind and said, I'm going to try. And here I am all these years later. Well, from doing that and obviously, you know, putting everything into uh, your music, where did your kind of break into the industry come from? Where, you know, when was that moment where you sat back and thought, Do you know what, I I'm doing this now, this is actually happening? Well, I started with my sister. I, I travelled with her for a couple of years, singing a few songs on her show. And that was a great, um, I suppose, start because it gave me the chance to observe the business without any big demands on me. And then in 83, I made a record and started a small band of my own. And that song, it was called My Donegal Shore. I come from County Donegal in Ireland. And that was the song, really, that started it out. Although it wasn't, I suppose, till about 1986 that... It took off. I recorded it in 83, but somehow um, about 80, late 85, 86, it started getting a lot of airplay on the radio at home. And um, it became a huge radio hit. Uh, not, not a hit on the charts because it wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't, it wasn't generally distributed, but all the radio stations had it and they all played the song. And uh, then I recorded it on an album that was released that that year, but coming into '86, and that really was the 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 beginning. When would I have said, "Yeah, this is working"? Um, I suppose '86, '87. I could see that you know we were having a big audiences no matter where we went. And I felt, you know, this is going to work for a while. I don't think I ever envisaged getting to do it at the level that I've been allowed to, you know, my career has, has taken me to. And for the, the length of it, the longevity is quite incredible, you know. So I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that, that something that I just enjoyed, almost like a hobby, became what I spent my life at. And the incredible thing is, like you, you mentioned now, like the longevity of, of what you've done, because a lot of people have uh, success in the charts for five years or so. Um, but you have continued every album that you've had. Uh, I think you were the first artist in uh, British music to have an album in the charts. 
every year for 25 years consecutively, which um, you were the first person to do that. Yeah, I, I don't know whether there was others had 25 years, but it seemed when I got to 25, well, I suppose 25 is, is a kind of a, 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 a number we mark anyway, but um, I, you know, it, it's, the, it's the audience really, it's the people who follow what I do that have allowed that to happen. And even now, you know, the first album that we had in the charts, not the first album we recorded, but the first when they went into the UK charts was back in 1988. And every year up until now, even this latest album um, got to number three in the charts, which which is amazing because, you know, what I do is not, it's not pop music and it's not on the radio every day and I'm not on the television every day, but yet the audience is there whenever I release an album that, <clears throat> you know, make, make, make it a, a, a success. And with the success that you, you have, do you kind of feel a little bit of pressure when you're releasing a new album? Is there ever that moment where you kind of step back and think, oh, is this going to be the one that doesn't make the charts? Does that ever come into it for you? Well, you know, I thought this year with the pandemic and I suppose the lack of, of um, ability for people to get out to shops and that because, you know, we're recommended not to only do essential things yeah. I thought you know albums are not going to be essentials and uh, the audience that would follow what I do I would have thought they wouldn't be downloaders or internet people but I'm obviously wrong <laughs> because they, they they got it up as high uh, as high as I've ever had in the charts uh, this one went so it's amazing what I love as well about when listening to your albums, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people that might say, for instance, have a lot of success in the 80s. And once they've left a record uh, label, make their own album, you hear the kind of real self, you know, they're true who they are as an artist. Um, but with your music, you, you've had that from the start to your recent album. It's always just been you, your passion comes out. So um, when it comes to, you know, putting an album together, and writing music, what do you look to, you know, for inspiration? Do you use things that happened in your own life? Well, if I'm writing, I suppose I write sometimes with with friends of mine, and sometimes you write, but generally it's just a topic. Maybe in the when two people are more than two people, sometimes are together writing. It's really a, a collaborative thing where everybody has their ideas of what might work and what might not work. Um, I record a lot of covers. I mean, this recent album are all covers of older songs. And um, I suppose that's why I've been able to record so much is that I'm not restricted to just doing originals. Although I've been given some very good original songs by people and recorded them and they've been very successful. So I'm not restricted in that way, you know, that I, I have to wait for to write an album, to record it, you know, because that would take a long time. And I think that's why, you know, those people that write their own stuff maybe only release an album every three or four years. Um, I, I just sing what I love, you know, even, even an original song that somebody sends me, I just have to love it. I, I know pretty much instantly whether I'm going to record it or not. I mean, this probably feels like this is your life because we just stated every kind of amazing achievement that you've had. But I, I wanted to talk about you receiving the, the MBE because that must have been one of those moments that you just pinch yourself because there's someone like you that's worked so hard and, and has such a love and passion for music. And then to actually be awarded by the royal family for that must have been just an amazing moment. So can you remember when you found out that you were receiving it? I can. I mean, I, I it was about maybe the... 29th of December or something uh, the year before that I, I received the award and it was on it was on the New Year's Honours list back in I would say it was 2001 going into 2002 that new year and I I got a call I think from somebody just saying would I accept it you know and I thought Number one, I didn't even think I could get the like of that because not you know I'm not from England and I'm not part we're not part of the Commonwealth, so I suppose I was cautious when I got the the first uh, message about it because you never know who's kind of making fun. So, um, 
then I realized how I, I did a bit of research as to how this could happen. And I was told that it was because a lot of people had written um, fans mainly, uh, not collectively, but individually. They got letters from people saying that they enjoyed the music. It's meant a lot to them. And could I be honored in some way on their behalf? Uh, wow. So because of that, it was, uh, you know, it was just such a lovely um, honor to get. And, you know, you don't expect these things, but I, I was very, very humbled by it. And it was awarded in the ambassador's residence in Dublin. And Prince Charles actually came, was there. I always say he came just special to present it <laughs> to me, but he, I think he was there doing something. And they tied it all in. It was the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, 2002. And it was just lovely. Uh, there was five of us got awards that day of different, you know, OBs and some with yeah. CBs. And, but um, I feel very, I was very privileged and, and uh, very grateful. Well, very well deserved. And I, I mean, another thing, obviously, here in the UK, the biggest show on TV, of course, is strictly come dancing and you uh, got to take part in one of the greatest shows and people that i've interviewed uh, um, have starred on it said it really is one of the best experiences so when they first approached you to take part in the show were you a little bit cautious or were you just straight away yes sign me up well you know we watch the show all the time i'm watching it now again and you know super it's just the the quality of the dance is, is fantastic some of them are just tremendous this year again and I'm nervous sitting watching it because you have no idea how nerve wracking it is and how I can't begin to tell you how nervous I was doing that. Um, I we watched, I was going to say, we watched the show and I was sitting one day with my Magella, my wife and her brother and, and his wife. And I said, I, I was taking a bit of time off um, and I said, because I would never be able to do it anyway, usually on my schedule. But I, I was I was taking that year off, and I we were do something came up about strictly. I says, I wonder if as if I wrote to them and said it was available, would the would the would the give me a chance to come on jokingly, and you know about two weeks later, an email came from my manager, and I was sitting in the seat, and Magella was sitting opposite, doing something, and I says, I got up and I says. Read that there, and we just couldn't believe it that that I was going to. I was asked, to, you know, would I would I consider going on strictly? So I just said immediately, I'll I'll do it. I'll just I will. I'll I'll go. And I then just the thing the wheel went into motion and and you're kind of caught up on a whole. Nobody knows you're going to do it, yeah. and it's all secrecy. And it's like God, you get this code name and. Um, I was I was called Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> what a and, name. Uh, it was funny, you know, because Tarzan, everything that came then was Tarzan will do this and Tarzan will do that. <clears throat> and uh, I I would do I mean I do just you just I got involved then and started, you know, met Christina and which was she was a great partner to have. But I just couldn't I mean I love dancing, but I'm I, I keep saying I'm organic because I I like to grow my own direction, um, and uh, I don't. I'm not not good to be in the same pl place at any given time. I'm very free range, but it was an amazing experience. But I, it was the best and the worst experience I had in my life because the best because of the razzmatazz and just when you go into the studio and the lights come on and the atmosphere of the people and even even now without the audience. There's still there's that great I mean the, the the way they do it and the the lighting is so good and the camaraderie among the, the guests as well the, the people that yeah. take part I mean we still our WhatsApp group, group is still active five years later so it was it was amazing what about facing Craig every week though because <laughs> you, you go to every judge and you just see his face and it must I just know be quite I know I know he's he's just he's so you know uh, well I suppose he has to be critical but he's so uh, stern on the on the show and then afterwards 
he is he really is lovely you know backstage yeah. he's so nice and I said Craig I says what's with these four points I says I'd have got that for speeding <laughs> <laughs> he says oh darling he says I just have to he says, I have to do I have to get I have to get under the skin of your fans <laughs> yeah well we, <laughs> but anyway it was a great experience yeah uh, just another quick question that I, I do have for you, this because I find it fascinating. With someone that's been in the industry as long as you have, have you ever had the opportunity to work with an artist that you actually looked up to when you were growing up or you were a oh, fan of? Oh, yes. Who would some of them be? I've been a great fan always of Loretta Lynn, the country singer, Charlie Pride and Cliff Richard. They would be my three favourites. Um, and I got, I've got to record with all three of them. I have got to do TV shows with um, Loretta and Charlie. And m my wife and I are very friendly with Cliff. You know, we have become good friends over the years and occasionally we go on holidays with him or maybe go to visit him in his house or he comes and stays with us. So um, it's very, very surreal to go from being a fan of somebody. And I went and stayed with Loretta um, for a weekend she she asked me many times and it's hard sometimes just to get to do things but a number of years ago I went and stayed with her in, in Tennessee and we sat there and you know she talked about writing songs and about her time you know when she met Patsy Klein first and it's 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 amazing as a fan of somebody and then to be kind of not on a level, a level playing field but you know, to be not in the place a fan would be. Yeah. You know, um, is, is incredible. I, I feel, you know, that it's it's so, so lovely to get the chance to to do that and, and to to meet. And, and, and I would talk to them, you know, every so often on the phone. Uh, not so much Charlie now, but Loretta, I would call, you know, every couple of months at least. Uh, she hasn't been, she had a stroke a few years ago and her health is not, her health is okay, but she's not able to perform. So I, I talk to her, you know, periodically to be able to um, just keep in touch with her. And Cliff, we talk to a lot, you know, I, wow. I saw him recently. Well, I mean, talking to fans, you have a, a such a nice relationship with yours and you're somebody that makes time at every show to meet your fans. Um, I believe you used to host kind of tea parties, actually, at your, your house um, for your fans. But we have yeah, yeah. Um, got some questions Years from ago. your fans. Uh -huh. Okay. Which is quite, um, but yeah, just, just talking about that, do, is that something you're always comfortable with? Just kind of, because you do have a really good relationship with them and you, you well, invite them to places and... I've always, I've always met people after the shows, you know, right from the very beginning. And I've got to know a lot of the people who come to the shows. Not all of them, but I know a lot. And some by sight, some by name, and some I know better than others. But I, I, I think that for me, it's been a very positive uh, thing to happen because it's lovely to walk out on the stage and actually recognize people in front of you, um, you know, that are at, at the show. Um, the the tea parties you talk about we call used to call them open days and that really happened by chance. I was doing shows local to home. The first and and at the Mary from Dunlow Festival that takes place every year, and I was doing shows there. First time I did a couple of shows uh, at the festival, and because we were two nights there, a lot of people travelled to be at it, and that day. The, the day of the show, uh, I was doing something. I don't know where I was. And I came back and my mother was alive at the time. She said, a lot of people came here looking for you today. So that evening, it was a Monday evening, we did the show. And I said, I know some of you came to the house today. I said, and I wasn't there. And I said, I'm not able to be there tomorrow, which we had a show on the Tuesday. But I said, if you're still here on Wednesday... At three o'clock, I'll make a point to be in there. And jokingly, I said, you never know, we might get a cup of tea. And this how it, people used to say, who thought up the idea of this great publicity stunt? It was just said on a whim. There was no no question of, of planning or anything like that. And um, it became 
I mean, a huge event. We did it for a number of years and then we took a break. And then it just got to the stage where too many people came. And I, the whole purpose was that I would meet people at home, but I was only meeting a fraction of the people that yeah. came, you know, because it would take like maybe eight or 10 hours in one day of just continually getting a picture taken. And still there was lots of people that I was just waving to from a distance. But it was a wonderful experience, uh, you know, because we live in the country, you know, at home. And all these people from all over the world, I mean, Sky News came and there was helicopters and CBS or NBC from America and all these, you know, putting it on the news about this strange situation that was happening in this very, very a rural part of West Donegal. Well, I know it is a great experience for your fans and some of them have got in just to ask a couple of questions um, for you. So um, Margaret uh, Eastall says, if COVID-19 is with us for the foreseeable future, what are your plans uh, in regards to tours and concerts? Are they going to be on permanent hold? Would you maybe be looking to do them over um, virtual? Anyway, uh, I, I think going forward, uh, we have to wait and see. We have to really wait to see how the pandemic pans out. Uh, and I think with only time we can actually hope to do something is when, when everything is passed, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah. then we've got um, Angela and um, Tame have both said, will you be doing more live streams? And if so, will the live streams be put onto a DVD? Was that something that has been looked well, at? Well, you know, we did a live stream. I did a live stream uh, just recently on Derry, oh, the band and I, uh, really to raise some funds for the band and crew because they haven't had a chance to work and it's really difficult for them to, you know, to make ends meet. So I asked them if they wanted to, that I would go with them and do a concert. And when it was the, the, the expenses were covered, that they could divide the profit, which they will do. And it was very successful. Um, they're talking now about doing a DVD of that. We didn't know if there would be an interest because I don't know how many people get DVDs anymore, but certainly I think it, we, we didn't think it might, might be, the quality might be good enough, but I think the quality is fine for what it is. So we may well do a lockdown DVD and put that one out and a CD as well at some point. Will I do any more? I'm not sure. It takes a lot of organisation and it's, it's difficult, you know, people have to go online and, and yeah. if you stream it, you have to charge for it because the streaming company charges. So it's a big effort. I did some things on Facebook uh, before just for free. People could just come in. So I probably will do some of them uh, very low key. I used to do, just do them with backing tracks. But uh, we'll see if, 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 if we think that people would like another live stream, it's not, I'm not saying we won't do it, but yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. And um, obviously today I've asked you lots of questions about kind of stuff that's um, been in your past and your career, but going forward now, do you have any plans that you can tell us about that you're working on or any upcoming projects? Well, I have an, I have an album um, recorded. I have another album recorded for next year. <laughs> so, uh, that I have that done uh, and uh, I suppose just waiting to see when we're planning hopefully we have shows planned starting next August you know that's the we have to plan uh, and see and ho hopefully but we don't know if it's not safe to do them then they'll have to be postponed yeah. again all these shows are postponed shows that were rescheduled but um, the first dates we have are in August in Killarney and then if, if everything's okay, then we will go to Canada in September, uh, the UK, uh, October, uh, America in November, and, you know. That's incredible how many places you get yeah. to go to. Yeah, yeah, and then Australia and New Zealand, that was cancelled too, so they're all to be done. Well, Daniel, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to get a chance to interview you today and have you on the show and talk about your career as well. It's just been incredible, so thank you. Thank you very much.